So I thought I would start off the kind of the first message of the year with a, a little survey. This is really easy, just raise your hand if kind of survey. So raise your hand if you love In-N-Out. The, yeah, the burger place. Yeah, of course, right? Double doubles, really good. I will say, though, the three by three is the correct mixture of meat and cheese to bread ratio, I'm just saying. Okay. How about ice cream? Raise your hand if you love ice cream. Yeah, dude, lots of ice cream, right? We do a Sunday, Sunday event in the summer where it's like a, it's like a topping potluck, and it's super good. I'm like, dude, give me diabetes today. It is so good, okay? How about really good steak? Anybody with really good? Yeah, me too, man. And I hope you're thinking medium rare because that's what Jesus would eat. It's so good that way. Uh, all right, the beach. Any beach lovers out there? Of course. I mean, we live in Southern California. Why else would we work so hard and you know, pay so much if we didn't love the beach? Like, if my in-laws invite me to the beach, I'm like, I'm there. It's, it's going to be awesome. My in-laws are actually awesome. But anyways, uh, here's the deal. If you go to work uh, on Monday and you say, man, I love steak or I love in and out like, no one's going to think that's weird. They're even going to maybe have a conversation with you about it. But for some reason, if you went to the same workplace on Monday and said, you know what, guys? I just freaking love my church it might be a little bit awkward. People might say, well, why don't you keep that to yourself, right? Uh, maybe, maybe love them in your head, okay? Uh, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because a lot of people grew up going to a church that they didn't like. Uh, or maybe they ne- didn't grow up going to church uh, and they tried it as a young adult or a college student and they had a, a weird experience and so they just, they don't love the church. Um, we hear all the time from new guests that check out East Lake Church, Imperial Beach, say things like, I never knew church could be like this. And I think a lot of people don't have a good picture of what church could be in their life. But I tell you this, I love the church. I love my church. God, through his son Jesus and through the local church, got my attention, woke me up, turned me around, saved my life, turned me from death to life, and rocked my world. And I'm here to tell you, at the end of the day, I love my church. I love this church. You can call me weird, you know, long-haired, surfer Jesus-looking hippie dude. I don't care. I love my church. I, I absolutely do. I think a lot of people have some mixed up ideas about the church, and they just have no idea what they're missing. For a long time, I had some mixed up ideas about the church and didn't know what I was missing. Well, today, as we start the first service of the year, I want to give us all a really clear picture of what is the church meant to be. It's not an institution. It's not an organization. It's more than a nonprofit, a building, or a service. It's not just an hour in a box with some other people. It's a powerful movement that has changed and is changing the world. And it will absolutely transform our everyday life in the most fulfilling way if we embrace it the way that God intended us to. So as we look at 2016 for a fresh start, a new chapter in our lives, I want us, you know, to to have a good way that we live up to our full potential by living joy-filled, fulfilling lives that please God and help others. And I believe the church is going to help us do that. Would you pull out that outline that you got when you walked in? If you didn't get one, I guarantee you the person next to you got two. So you can get one from them, okay? You can also use the East Lake Church app. Just select the Imperial Beach campus. You'll be looking at the same thing we're all looking at. You can take notes and email them to yourself right there on your phone. We're going to be looking at four metaphors, four biblical word pictures that the Bible uses to describe the church. And by the way, when it describes the church, it's describing the followers of Jesus. Again, not an institution, not a building. For these, each of these descriptions, there's going to be a response. Because if this is describing us, you and me, followers of Jesus, people, then these descriptions should have some implications for our lives. So we're going to write down four responses, an action that we can take in 2016 to fulfill what I believe is our spiritual destiny and realize God's will in our lives. So write this first one down. The church is a bride. Yeah, the church is a bride. Many places in the Bible, the church is called the bride of Christ. I included a passage of scripture that you might be familiar with, even if you're not a church goer or you're kind of new to this whole God thing. It's probably a verse that you've heard at weddings. Uh, It's usually used in the context of how a husband should love their wives. But this time I want you to look for what it says about Christ and his relationship with the church, okay? Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it to make it belong to God. Christ used the word to make the church clean by washing it with water. That's a picture of baptism. He died so that he could give the church to himself like a bride in all her beauty. Underline bride in all her beauty. He died so that the church could be pure and without fault, with no evil or sin or any other wrong thing in it. This is a striking word picture, a bride in all her beauty. We've all been to weddings. We know what it's like. I I do weddings like it's my job (laughs) because it is my job. Anyway, uh, I know what it's like. I'm down at the altar. 
no one cares, wah, wah, no one takes pictures of me, right? Like, it's not about me, it's, it's, it's not what happens. The groom comes down the aisle, and everybody watches, and they're thinking, like, sucka. You know, I don't know, I don't know what they're thinking. They, they pay some attention to him. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe this is what I'm thinking because I'm at too many weddings. I don't know. Um, the bridal party comes down the, the aisle. People are thinking about, oh, look, she's with him. And he's like, okay, cool. And they, they, you know, they maybe take some pictures. There's some attention given, but not a whole lot. And then the entire atmosphere changes, right? The doors close in the back. The music changes. Everybody turns and cranes and tries to get a look. And the doors open. And the bride steps out. And there's this whispered, like, oh. you hear this collective gasp, right? And everybody is just, like, enthralled. And they're like, look how happy she is. Right? Like, look at all this stuff. Imagine in that moment, if someone stood up and was like, boo, boo the bride, boo you suck, like boo, and you're like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm here for the groom, I don't, I don't like the, okay, first of all, he wouldn't even get that far before like Aunt Edna would like blindside him with a flying tackle, right? <laughs> That's preposterous, yet it's not uncommon for people to say things like, you know, I like Jesus, I'm okay with Jesus, I just don't like the church. Hmm. You got to be careful with that because Christ sees the church like a groom sees his bride and you don't diss someone's bride. Like if someone pulled me aside and was like, Hey Matt, I just want to let you know, dude, I I totally dig you. I think you're really cool. I get this a lot, obviously. And, and they're like, here's the thing though. I just can't stand to be around your wife, Christy. Like she just drives me, dude, that person better be ready to be punched in the throat because that's what's happening next, right? Like you don't diss somebody's bride. So we really don't want to be I mean, it really shouldn't stand for people, or, or, or people are very confused and misunderstanding the way things are when they're saying, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church, okay? Remember, Christ loves his bride, the church. He's committed to his bride, the church, so much so that he's, it says that he gave his life for her. He eagerly awaits to be reunited with her like a groom waiting at the end of the aisle. That's some pretty powerful imagery. So if we're a part of the church and we're a part of Christ's bride, What should our response be to that reality? Well, write this down. Our response is that we need to commit wholeheartedly. We want to commit wholeheartedly. We say all the time that Eastlake Church, uh, ELC IB, is a safe place to kick the tires of Christianity, to process your faith. We have what we say is a come and see, or a come as you are, I'm sorry, environment. But you know what? It's not a stay as you are environment. I believe that God wants to transform your heart, transform your life. And he doesn't do that all at once. It's not like, oh, fix everything and then God will love you. No, he loves you like you are, and he wants you to, you to reach your full potential. So he wants you to begin to take next right spiritual steps. And they're, they're little steps that add up to a long journey. I mean, if you took one step east, you know, every day, eventually you'd end up in New York City. That's how that works. Like, it just eventually you end up somewhere far away. I think you'd be in Florida because you'd have to be kind of going northeast, whatever. Okay, maybe for you, you've been kind of a, a CEO. What's that? Not of a business, sorry. A Christmas Easter only attender, okay? <laughs> so, like, it, here's the deal. First of all, I, I don't want to diss that because that, that's actually a spiritual step. Like, if you grew up with no church experience and now you're married to somebody and they have this religion thing and you support them by going twice a year, that's putting you in a spiritual environment that's good for you. So I'm not dissing that. But maybe, and if you're here today, way to go, because it's not Christmas or Easter, so that's awesome. Uh, And way to go taking that next right spiritual step of becoming a casual attender, okay? A casual attender decides each week based on, you know, the way things are and what the charter schedule is and how much sleep they got that week or whatever, whether or not they're going to go to church, okay? And there's, again, that's, that's a place where people are at, and that may be so much further than where they grew up or where they have been, so I'm not dissing that, okay? But maybe it's time to take a a next right step from being a casual attender to being a regular attender. A regular attender is somebody who decides, you know what, I attend Eastlake Church. If I'm not working, right, because sometimes you're working, you can't be here if you're working, or if I'm not out of town or sick, I'm going to be at church. But those are the only reasons that I won't be at church. Man, putting yourself in that kind of environment will help you grow, okay, and that's a next right step of commitment. Or maybe you've been a regular attender and you're going to move from being a consumer 
Someone who takes in, like, the awesome music and drinks the good coffee and listens to the amazing preaching, you know. And then, but they don't, you know, and, they, and they're, they're using it in their life. I'm not, like, again, this is a good step to be at. But now they're going to become a contributor. They're going to say, man, I felt so welcomed when I came and I felt so comfortable. And a lot of it was because of all the volunteers that helped me feel comfortable and helped make sure everything was ready for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start coming a little bit early and, and be a part of this. You're going to be a contributor, right? So, so maybe those are some next right steps that you might consider taking. Now, don't get nervous if you've never committed to a church before because, again, we're not asking you to go from zero to, like, marriage, okay? You don't just, like, relationships don't just start with, like, oh, I was on a blind marriage the other day. It was kind of uncomfortable. Like, like that's not how it works. Uh, we start with dating, right? Because, first of all, you want to make sure that they're not crazy, right? Lots of blind dates don't even finish. Like, they, it's not like we don't get a second one. It's like, I left. I pretended I never even saw them. We just miss, missed ships in the night, right? Like, that's that. But you're not meant to date forever. I mean, you want to make sure that, there's, that you know, it's not crazy, but you're not meant to date forever. Eventually, the time comes to commit. When it comes to the church, God's plan isn't for you to date the church forever. Sure, start that way. Keep your options open. Make sure that we're not a cult. I encourage you to do that. But, you know, once the, you know that this is the church for you and this is your church home, then in the words of the great theologian Beyonce, you better put a ring on it, right? That's... Uh, <laughs> I hear this question a lot, uh, especially from my kind of non-church friends and people in the community. Well, can I be a Christian and never go to church? <sighs> not really. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I mean, I guess you could be married on paper, but not live with your spouse and not see your kids and just like on your tax forms you're married. I mean, I guess, but like that certainly isn't the best for your relationship. And it's definitely not the best for your relationship with God. Bottom line is I believe that's a spiritual myth and it's not God's will for you. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Well, what if I go to lots of churches, right? I go to this one for the music and this one for the kids' programming. The coffee's really good over here. This other one for the preaching. Obviously, this church, right? <laughs> okay, well, you could do that, but, I mean, they have a name for people who do that in relationships, don't they? Right? Hop from bed to bed and person to person, just taking what they want and never committing. Hmm. Don't really want to be that. When you resist commitment to a local church, here's the deal. Everyone gets cheated out of God's best, okay? First of all, you get cheated you cheat yourself because you never fully experience what the church is meant to be, the church experience. It's like going to a 3D movie but not putting on the glasses. Like the music was good and I kind of got the story, but man, it was kind of blurry and not that great. And everybody else is like really into it. Well, that's because they're experiencing it the way it was meant to be. But if you don't commit to a local church, if you don't get involved, you're only, ex you, you know, you're sitting here, you're experiencing it, but you're not getting the full experience. So you cheat yourself. You also cheat the church community. Others will benefit from you and your involvement. Your unique story, your unique background, your experiences, your skills, they are going to benefit the rest of us. Knowing you and your story is going to enrich our lives. So we want to know you. And you also cheat the world because here's the deal. You have a part to play in what God wants to do in this world. The church is his plan to help connect people back to him. And you miss out on being a part of something so significant when it's just you in the Bible, you know, and the internet on a cave or whatever. There's no Wi-Fi in caves. That doesn't even make sense. A big way that we express our commitment here at Eastlake Church is through membership. That's our 101 seminar. We offer it, you know, quarterly. We're offering it again in March uh, the 11th. You can find out what it means to join the team. It's kind of our basics of here, what is the church all about? Uh, and is this the church for you? And you know what? Sometimes people go to that and it's like a first date where they get a little too much information. They're like, whoa, this is not the church for me. Like, I always thought the music was too loud and I thought this was the chance to tell you and now I realize you do it on purpose and this is, this is never going to work for us, right? And that's okay. Here's the deal. Like, I shake hands with those people and I'm like, great, man. But here's the thing. I hope that you can find a church that you can fully commit to because I still believe that's God's will for you. It's not God's will for every single person to go to East Lake Church, okay? It's God's will for every single person to be a part of the capital C church. That is people finding and following Jesus with their lives in community. So there are lots of different communities, lots of different flavors that fit different people and different lifestyles. So our next membership is coming up on uh, March 11th. It'll be on the connection card next week. So that's a good way that you can commit wholeheartedly. Again, that's a spiritual step. It may not be all the way there yet, and that's okay. Another description found uh, for the church in the Bible is a family. Write that down, a family. The power of Christianity is not only changing the lives of individuals, it's intended to create a whole new kind of community as well. In the midst of a broken world, a world that's been divided by race and politics and class and gender and politics, the church is to be a place of hope and inclusion. 
where people who were once separated from God and each other become God's children and members of the same family. Ephesians 2.19 is the verse I used for that. So you are no longer strangers and outsiders. You are citizens together with God's people. You are members of God's family. All those who've opened their hearts to God's grace are now a part of this great big spiritual family. And in this family, you should be able to find acceptance and grace and love and encouragement. And most of the time you do, but I do want to recognize uh, that this is not always done perfectly. In fact, it's often done imperfectly. The church is made up of imperfect people. And imperfect people make mistakes. I make mistakes. People in our church will make mistakes. God has a way of using our church uh, specifically to reach a lot of people who are far from God. And many of them never knew him, and this is their first experience. Our church reaches a lot of people like that. Others, a lot of times, used to be close to God, but they got off track after a bad church experience, okay? And when I say a bad church experience, I don't mean like they were at church, and one time a pastor told a joke, and it wasn't that funny, right? <laughs> that's, that's not it. That was a good example of that, though. Um, or, or, you know, they were having communion, and they kind of choked on the cracker and went down the wrong tube. It's a bad church experience. Like, I'm not talking Yelp review kind of stuff. I'm talking like they were hurt by someone in the church, Someone in the church family, right? It could have been a pastor or a growth group leader or another attender or a member, but somebody in the church did something that hurt their feelings or that was unkind to them and they didn't make it right uh, or they dug their heels in and they, they were hurt by someone in the church. I assure you that Jesus is coming back to make all things right, but for now, we're all works in progress and that means that sometimes we mess up. I'll say something dumb, okay? You'll say something dumb. Look at Pastor James. He says dumb stuff all the time, Okay. <laughs> Even at our church, which I think is pretty healthy, we have a level of dysfunction. But dysfunction can exist in a healthy family. It's all about whether you handle dysfunction in a functional, healthy way. And that's what we're committed to doing. So at Eastlake Church, we're committed to handling dysfunction in a healthy way. Well, what does that look like? Well, one of the things is that we are very committed to a biblical principle, which is gossip is a sin, and we don't tolerate gossip, okay? Now, lots of people come from lots of environments. Maybe that's what they do all day at work is gossip about their coworkers, and they join a growth group, and all of a sudden, they're gossiping about somebody. What do we do? Well, we confront them about it, and how do we do that? We do that lovingly, right? So we're talking about, oh my gosh, do you know what Jennifer did? No, I didn't. Oh, really? That sounds serious. I'm going to get her on the phone right now, and let's, let's talk to her. Whoa, whoa, no. I, well, just uh, like, well, back it down a little bit. Well, oh, okay. Oh, well, it sounds like what you were doing is gossiping then, because if you, if you wouldn't if you have something against somebody, the Bible says you should go to them, right? Not, not come to me, not come to someone else. And I understand you probably, probably new information for you. So let's, let's do that together, okay? So that's how we would handle a gossiping situation. That's what, what we call, uh, really, Matthew 18. You might write that down in the, in the margin. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. Chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. is really the Bible's conflict resolution manual. It talks about how do you handle conflict in the church. And what it is is you go to the person, and if they deny it, they say, no, I'm not in sin, you're wrong, whatever. Then you bring somebody, a witness with you, and you say, hey, listen, like we both care and we love about you. We love you, and what you did was wrong, and we're just looking to help you like, change that behavior. And like, let's all be friends again, right? And then, and then you escalate it from there. And so that, there's a conflict. That's what we do. Another principle that we adhere to is uh, what we call LOWO. It's lights on, windows open, okay? So if something needs to be said, we say it, okay? Again, we do that in love. We don't fake it. Uh, it means that I'm going to talk about being imperfect and being in struggle. It means that I'm going to apologize when I make a mistake. Lights on, windows open. Guess what? I'm not perfect, and I did something wrong, and I need you to forgive me, okay? So that's how we handle dysfunction in a functional, healthy way. I hope that makes sense. Now, here's the deal. It's a challenge to operate in a family because a family knows you and they experience the best of you and they experience the worst of you, right? Like, here's the thing with relationships is that when you're known, it exposes those rough edges that you need a little bit sanding down, right? That God's working on your heart that you may not be aware of and it's just you, you don't think about. But when you're with other people, it, it kind of, they notice it and they may say something about it or it may get exposed. Think about this. Uh, at work... Is it a regular thing for you to maybe like kick the copier, the copier or throw your coffee cup or grab someone by the shoulders and be like, why won't you listen, right? Probably not, but has that ever happened in your home growing up or at home? Possibly. I kick cabinets sometimes. I shouldn't do that. I don't do it at the church office. You better believe that, right? We know how to believe. We know how to work with each other normally. But when you're in a family, you see the best of each other and you see the worst of each other. And that's true as you become known in a church family. Again, it exposes a little bit more of you and it exposes sometimes the things that you need to work, work on, right? So families, uh, here's the thing. A healthy family can work through difficulty. They can overcome differences. And when they do, 
They're going to experience a strength and satisfaction in life unlike anything else. Families are there for each other in ways that no one else can explain. I mean, they'll drop everything to be there for each other. They'll drive across state lines, right, to, like, help somebody move or a baby be born or whatever's going on. I have hundreds of stories in, of our church being this kind of family to one another. This week on vacation, I had some interesting kind of health stuff come up for me, and I went surfing with a buddy yesterday, and I was just telling him about it. It's something he's been through, and he listened to me and, like, just... Just, I don't know, it was cool because I, I ended up having to get out because I had a migraine and just wasn't feeling good. And uh, I, I took a shower and when I got out, I got a text from him that was like, hey bro, uh, thanks for telling me what's going on. I'm always here if you, if you need to talk and I can give you advice or just listen. And I was like, what a nice text to get from somebody in our church. And I love that our church is full of people that when you're known and you get in relationship, you can support each other. And it's, it's really, really cool that it happens. So... I've been on the giving end, I've been on the receiving end of this multiple times. I can tell you that this happens and that God's family absolutely rocks. It's really good to be connected. Okay, so what's our response to being a part of God's family? Our response is that we need to connect authentically. I mentioned earlier the spiritual myth that you can grow to spiritual maturity by yourself. You, you cannot. You're never going to fully develop with just you and the Bible because, again, those rough edges don't get exposed until you get with other people, right? And also, we need to other people in our life because God's called us into community, but also the Bible says 58 times in the New Testament that we need one another, okay? There's all these one another's, love one another, care for one another, serve one another, help one another, encourage one another, pray for one another. That's just a few of the 58. You can't do those things if it's just you and Jesus. You need one another to be around. This is why we do growth groups. What's a growth group? A growth group is a midweek gathering. We gather for like weekly for six or eight weeks at a time. And it's, it's, a, it's the same people, eight to 12 of us. And we, we become friends. We learn more about following Jesus and we help each other grow. And something that I hear all the time when people really start getting involved in a growth group for the first time is how it feels like they found the family that they were looking for. I mean, San Diego is home to more transplants than locals. And it's something that people miss and that they find when they get connected in the church family. We're going to be doing groups uh, really soon. If you're not connected in a group, or maybe you were at one time, but you've just kind of gotten away from that, uh, we're going to be doing those. And don't miss signups. They actually happen in, uh, later this month, because we're going to be doing in February uh, a series uh, of, of growth groups. Now, here's the deal. In our last series that we did our growth groups, we did a six-week message series on work, how to get the most uh, satisfaction and fulfillment out of work, how to work like you're working for God no matter what you do. And it was a great series. We also had a growth group component that went with that. 57% of the adults in our church were involved every single week in a growth group. That's awesome, okay? Now, if you were one of the minority that passed last round or you started but didn't attend all six weeks, like you went once or twice and just didn't make it a priority, I hope that this week, or this, in 2016, you'll make the commitment to, you know what, I'm going to connect authentically. I'm going to make the decision now that when group signups happen, I'm going to sign up and I'm going to show up for all six weeks and just see if God doesn't radically change the relationships as you become a part of his family. So six weeks from now, we're going to start, uh, my goal is to start 20 different groups. That's plenty of groups for all 100% of the adults in our church to be involved in a growth group. And my prayer and hope is that we get 100% of people involved. And because I really believe it's going to be something good for you. And not just because you're going to look, like grow and learn from the content. I know that's true. But because I want everyone in our church to know what it's like to experience what it's like to be a part of God's healthy family. The next description of the church that we see in scripture is a body. You can write this down, a body. The church is so close to the heart of God, it's so central to how he moves in the world, that scripture calls us the body of Christ. That's pretty incredible. As we worship, as we serve, as we show love in the world, we become the body of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus on this earth, showing the world, as he did, what God's love is really like. I mean, Jesus came as the expression of God on the earth to show people how to have a relationship with God, and now that's our job, to show the world the same thing. That's pretty incredible. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. I would encourage you to read, like just as homework this week, go back and read all of chapter 12. It talks a lot about how we're each a part of the body, and no part's better than the other, and we all have important jobs to do, and it's, it's all about how God will take your uniquenesses, your individual talents, personalities, and life experiences, and use that, all that is uniquely you, in his body, the church, to do his work. You need to know that you are important and your gifts are absolutely needed. 
to be honest with you, one of the challenges in leading a church like ours is overcoming the perception that we have everything that we already need. I mean, you come in and everything is done, right? We have volunteers serving everywhere. You walk on campus and there's people wearing name tags. You go check in your kids and there's people wearing shirts and everybody's happy and the kids are doing great. And there's coffee and it's already hot and it's ready and everything's ready for you. And there's people at the name tag artist table and they're writing down your name, right? And you come sit down and there's already a chair for you and the music is on point. And the preaching, oh my gosh, so good. <laughs> There's this natural tendency that you could think that you're not needed because everything's already done. The truth is that the opposite is true. The more a church focuses on having everything together so that when guests come, they're not distracted and they're able to just connect with God, the more people are needed. I mean, just think about this. Six months ago, we didn't have name tag artists. And somebody said, you know what? It's, it's so awkward because I feel like I should know people's names. I've had conversations, and it's like, this is the second or third one, and I end up keeping it kind of surfacy because I, I don't want it to be exposed that I don't know their name. What if we had name tags, and then everybody would, like, get right past that? And it was like, okay. So we had to create a new team, get a bunch of volunteers, and we found some cool people who like to do that. And all of a sudden... Conversa like the it's funny, we measured it, but like the amount of time people hung out after service went from like two to three minutes to five to ten minutes, like just by doing that one change. So we're always looking for new ways that we can help people connect, and it's just something that is true. When we want to focus on helping people find and follow Jesus as we do, we're always going to need more people to do that. It's really cool, too, because there's something really powerful about getting up early to come set up church in a portable environment or coming early to, to, to brew coffee or standing at a table to help people, you know, connect because you get to be in a first row seat and see people who are far from God get close to God. You get to be a part of the mission of the church doing something really powerful and really cool. So it really is something that's a, a fun to be on. And the truth is, everybody is needed. This place doesn't run every week on magic Jesus dust. <laughs> It doesn't, like, you know, little Jesus fairies don't come through and sprinkle a little dust and, you know, the things just do, 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 just hop out of the trailer and transform this, like, cafetorium or whatever it is into a church, okay? All of the stuff that you see and touch isn't here, and we pull it out of trucks every week. Any connection that you've made, every time that your kids had fun, every great experience you've had, every cup of coffee that you've drank, every chair that you've sat in, every musical note to hit your ear was made possible by teams of volunteers committed to loving you for Jesus. So what's our response? Our response is that we want to serve passionately. When people say things like, I just don't feel like the, pre I don't feel the presence of God at church like I used to, or I'm not getting as much out of church anymore, almost always those feelings are symptoms of a bigger problem, which is that they've stopped being invested and involved. The question is, what were you doing with your time, with your treasure, and with your heart that you're not doing anymore? Were you involved in the life of the church and you just kind of drifted off? Maybe you were serving on a team and helping make things happen, but then, you know, schedule at work got you off track with that and you just kind of never got back into it. Now you don't feel God anymore. Well, dude, you were a part of God's mission, helping being his hands and feet, and now you're not. That makes sense to me. When was the last time you gave financially and invested in what you believe is something that's helped you and wants to, and uh, that will help other people? Were you praying for others? Were you praying for your church and now you've kind of stopped You're in a spiritual rut? If you've drifted off, and this happens, you know, maybe from growth groups or from ministry teams, that's the life of the church, this is how we participate in the body, uh, then it's time to get plugged back in. You only feel God's presence and feel connected to his purposes when you participate. That's just a truth. Like, people say, I don't feel like I'm growing anymore, and, and when you ask those questions, it's like, oh, well, I don't do any of those things. Well, of course not, if you're not doing anything. When I'm sitting on the couch watching Netflix pounding a plate of carne asada fries, I don't feel like I'm getting in shape. Because I'm not, right? Even if I'm watching P90X. So even, like, it's like, that's not how that works, okay? So if you're in church and you're going, well, I'm at church, why don't I feel God anymore? It's like, well, dude, like, what are you doing? Because you've got to do something, right? You have to react. It's why every week we have a spiritual, like, what's my next right step? This week I will. Because if we don't do anything, all we're doing is collecting information. That doesn't do anything. I could memorize the P90X workout, but if I don't do it, I'm not going to be as shredded as I am because I'll be, you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> all right. Here's the deal. God never called you to attend. He called you to belong. 
You don't make a difference with your attendance. You make a difference with your involvement. That's just the truth of the world. And it's more important than ever for us, uh, specifically at this campus and this location, because we're more plugged in than ever before with our community. And this is opening some really cool doors, okay? In the summer, uh, we figured out how to get involved with the um, sandcastles. We, did a, we, were, we had a, the car that we built, we had the parade, and then we had a booth where we just gave away really cool stuff, and we were really normal and cool with people, and we made some good friends, and for the eight weeks following the Sandcastles weekend, we had record-breaking attendance. Like, it was so much so that we were looking at, like, I think we might need to add a third service. Like, if we grow any more, we're going to have to change, like, the way we do everything, and that was really cool. Well, now, we've made friends with people who are in charge, so we got invited to be a part of the Christmas Comes to IB event that the city puts on. They made us the headlining musical act. It was awesome. I mean, many of you were there. We rocked the beach at sunset. It was incredible. Uh, singing some Christmas carols. If we see the kind of event, uh, the kind of event that, of growth that we saw after Sandcastles in the first quarter of 2016, like, especially since we don't have to compete with the Chargers this year, <laughs> uh, who knows what could happen? I mean, we may be looking at a third service very, very soon. Sorry, Chargers fans. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I don't think we get a wild card slot this year. It's, it's a bummer. Yeah, too soon, too soon. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, what's next? Three services? Who knows? But you know what? That stuff isn't free. More people means that we have to get here a little bit earlier to set up, which means we need a few more guys on the setup team, right? It means that we're going to need three teams to greet. It means that we're going to need an extra team of name tag artists, an extra team for each of the seven kids' ministries that we have. Uh, it means that we're going to need to grow all of our teams to reach more people. And I'm happy to tell you that we used to have one service and we had two. And we saw the church grow in this really cool way where everybody got involved and served passionately. And now we're getting ready to do it again. It's pretty exciting. But imagine what would happen if everybody did this, like if they served passionately. For us, we say uh, a good goal is to attend one, serve one. It's one of the beautiful things about having multiple services. Like when we only had one, you had to choose, am I going to watch kids so other people can go to church or am I going to get to go to church, right? That was very difficult. When we had two, you could attend one and you could serve the other. And so many people will attend this service and then they'll stay to make name tags for the next service and then leave after 20 minutes, right? That's the way that, that we do it. And so if we had a third service, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for people to do that. What if we did that? Like, what if we had no spectators in our church? If everybody said, you know what? I know God's gifted me and made me special, and I'm going to find my purpose and how it, how it helps move the mission forward for Jesus. What kind of power, what kind of difference would we have on the South Bay and on, in Imperial Beach and in this world? The last description of the church that we see in Scripture is the church is like a building. A building. Now, don't get confused. The church is not a building, okay? Obviously, it's not a rented school, but even two or three years from now, if we're in a permanent location and we have a cross on the building and stained glass windows or whatever you think a church should have, uh, it, it still won't be the church, okay? The church is people. It's you and me. Again, these are biblical metaphors to help us understand uh, striking word pictures that the Bible uses to describe the church and help us understand its purposes. We say all the time around here that East Lake Church is not, you know, Mendoza Elementary. Like, the principal could call me into our office on Monday and, like, rip the contract up, okay? We would be, like, homeless, but we would still exist, right? We would find another place to meet. East Lake Church would still exist in all of our homes and on Facebook and everywhere else. If we got kicked out tomorrow, we would still exist. doesn't matter where we meet because we are the church, you and I, people. Buildings are resources that God uses to accomplish his mission, but it's not the end-all, be-all. So take a look at how the church, you and me, are described in this next verse. You are also like living stones. Underline that. So let yourselves be used to build a spiritual temple, to be holy priests who offer spiritual sacrifices to God. This building, is comp this church that we're talking about here, this metaphorical church, is composed of living stones. That's us. We make up the church. And through the church, God is creating a structure like no other in all of history. It's not made of stones or bricks. It's greater than any cathedral ever built. It is the church of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, it's not in your outline, but it talks about our bodies being the temple of the Holy Spirit, that the, the, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. This passage reveals that our individual temples come together to make up this greater spiritual temple. And for what purpose? To offer spiritual sacrifices to God. Well, what does that mean? It's talking about coming together to worship corporately. It's gatherings just like this when we worship God with our voices and we make his name, you know, a great in our lives and in our, you know, we set our weeks straight that way, right? It means that we, you know, we give financially, we give with our time, we offer spiritual sacrifices by coming early to help set up or staying late to fold up chairs or do whatever we do. Those are spiritual sacrifices that we offer together as the body of Christ. What does it mean? Well, uh, it's, it's, again, coming together corporately. When the church is gathered to, together to publicly worship and hear God's words taught, 
something supernatural happens. It just takes place where in a way that doesn't happen in even the most powerful personal worship, things happen when we gather together. Maybe just because, you know, it's the gifts that we don't all have, right? Like, maybe I'm able to talk about scripture in a way that makes more sense to you. And, you know, like, Vita can sing, like, oh my gosh, right? Like, I, personal worship for me, not that beautiful, right? But I get chills when I'm here singing with you guys. Like, it's a totally different experience. That's why we meet every week. It's not a random idea or an extracurricular activity. It's instructed in the Bible. God knows that we need the strength and that we need the hope and the help that we're going to receive from his presence and each other when we worship together. Uh, It's not in your notes, but Hebrews 10 talks about how we should not give up meeting together, that we should keep in that habit. Well, what's our response to the church being like a living building? We want to worship faithfully. What's faithfully? It means that, number one, we're going to give it all we got while we're here. So that means that even though it's awkward, we're going to take the notes and write something down, right? Uh, we're We're going to participate. It also means that we're going to be here regularly. I'm going to offer a challenge for 2016. Like, this is a resolution you could make a little bit late because you're here and you already did it. But make attendance a priority in 2016. Because here's the deal. When you miss a worship experience, you miss out on something that doesn't happen again. You miss out on a unique moment with God and on a unique message and a unique worship set that was created to help bring you to a place with Jesus. And that week is over. And you miss, it, you miss out on it. You miss out on what God wants to do in your life. I'm all, and I, here's the deal, I'm not trying to guilt anybody into anything, okay? That doesn't work and it doesn't last. I'm not interested in that. I'm trying to encourage you to get the most out of God's plan for you, his church. I love the church, okay? My life is better because I've been a part and connected to the church. I've been encouraged and supported through relationships that I've made here. I've found meaning in using my gifts. I've helped others experience the fresh start and the new life that they never knew could exist, that I found out could exist because of this church. And I want the same great experiences that I've had for you. So this isn't about guilt. This is about me really wanting something, not from you, but for you. I want you to experience the satisfaction and the joy that comes from being a part of the church of Jesus Christ. Our staff and our leaders have been praying and working hard for months to be ready for the first quarter of 2016. And we've got some really cool stuff planned. Uh, It's going to be life-changing. In next week, we're starting a new series called Restart, okay? All about getting started on the right foot in the new year. It's going to be a really, really good message. So make a commitment. Like, dude, I'm going to be here for every week of that series and see if it doesn't set me up for success this year. In February, we're going to do a relationship series called It's Complicated. If you've ever been a part of a relationship, you know that's a good title, right? Even if you're just the child in a child-parent relationship. It's not just for couples, okay? This is like relationships in life. With that series, we're going to be doing growth groups, okay? They launch in February. So I'm encouraging you to jump in, jump in. Like, get plugged into a group, even if you had a weird experience, whatever. Some people are weird, okay? They're allowed to go to church here, all right? Uh, Find a different group, okay? Money study seminar, we're offering that in February. This is something that historically in our church has has offered so much help and healing to people in the areas of finances. It really is designed to help you get out of debt, stop living paycheck to paycheck, start living more freely, more obediently, more generously. And who doesn't want that? It's, it's, It's great. That's starting in February. The 101 seminar happens in March. And then East Lake Serves is happening in the first quarter. That's where we get together in a big group to do a service project, not for this organization, but outside to serve another organization in the community or serve the community at large. It's pretty cool. So God's going to do some amazing things in our lives and in our relationships with our kids, uh, in our finances, our marriages, our personal life, our community. So be here every week because God has something for you. Well, let's look at one last verse about the church, and these are the words of Jesus. I love this verse. This is like a paint half your face blue and, you know, the whole Braveheart stuff. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Nothing is going to stop the church of Jesus Christ, okay? As we look back through history, we realize that persecution hasn't been able to stop it, okay? Like, they used to set you on fire if you said you wanted to follow Jesus. Like, that's a real thing that happened, okay? It couldn't stop the growth of the church. Theological controversy hasn't stopped it. Scandal hasn't stopped it. Poor leadership hasn't stopped it. Cheesy Christian Facebook (laughs) posts? Like for Jesus, scroll for the devil. That hasn't been able to stop it, okay? Like, people with doubts and tough questions haven't been able to stop it. Hypocrisy has not been able to stop the growth of the church. As a matter of fact, nothing ever has stopped or will stop the expansion of God's kingdom on this planet. And here's the most amazing thing to me is that we are invited to be a part of this life-changing movement that's meant to reach the world with God's love. That's so incredible. The greatest living movement the world has ever known, the Church of Jesus Christ, Jesus is still building his church. 
And you and I are indispensable ingredients to what he wants done in this world. God's will for what he wants to accomplish in this world includes you. Okay, what if I really believe that? What if I said, okay, I'm all in. This year, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find my place. I'm going to commit to this church. I'm going to be connected to a group this February. I'm going to serve on a ministry team. I'm going to be fully obedient to whatever God's asked me to do. Then I think we would see so many changes in our lives, in our world, in our community. I mean, it would just be outrageous. I really hope that, that we just do it. All right, so I'm going to close with this. Uh, you know, it's more important than what I say today or what you learned is what you actually do. So would you do this? Uh, everybody, like 100%, would you pull out that blue connection card that you got when you walked in? Okay, and if you like dodged an usher, we put two in every program, so your spouse or somebody near you has one. Uh, so just hand one to somebody if they're trying to resist, okay? Uh, here's the deal. Every week, this week I will what? And this is an opportunity for you to have a moment with Jesus where he's going to identify something that you can do in 2016 that's going to help change your life. So maybe for the first time, you're going to stop being casual. Like you've been casual, you've been cautious, and you're going to dating the church to see if crazy comes out. And you go, you know what? 2016, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to go all in. Or maybe you were plugged in, but life got busy and you just got, kind of got into a rut and you got disconnected and haven't got reconnected, right? Like you got deployed and now you're back and it's just, you know, whatever. Like now's the time. Make a recommitment. <laughs> make a recommitment in 2016, a fresh start. Play your part in what Jesus says is the hope of the world, his church. So I'm going to do this. I want to take a moment of silence and I just want you to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. What is God saying to you that you can commit to? It might be prioritized attendance or attend every week of the Restart series. Or maybe you're going to host a growth group. Like it was on your heart last time you didn't do it or whatever. Or now you've got a, a home. Whatever. Join a six-week growth group. Attend one, serve one. 101 seminar. The, you know, the, the money seminar. Whatever it is, I'm going to give us like 20 seconds of awkward silence. But hopefully it won't be awkward because Jesus will be talking to you. And I want you to just write down whatever you think it is. And I'm going to close in prayer. Jesus, as we, your church, consider what you have for us this year and hold that card in our hand, I just want to pray over us. Lord, I pray that you would help us be your church. I, help, I pray that you would help us see ourselves the way that you do, as valuable to you, as part of your church that you love and you believe in. Help us find our place, our role, fulfill our part. Thank you for including us in what you do. Help us at Eastlake Church Imperial Beach be the body of Christ to show your love in the way that we serve our community and our world. This is not about making us or our name or, you know, our local church great. It's all about you. I pray that your name would be great over our lives and the lives of our friends and our loved ones. In your name we pray. Amen.